I'm Ashton Addison from BlockWest Capital for Investment Pitch Media, and today on the Crypto Coin Show, we have Raphael Cosman, the CEO of Trust Token. Raphael, welcome to the show, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Ashton. It's great to be on. Likewise, I'm excited to dive into uh, your insights into the DeFi space and what Trust Token and TrueFi is, is working on. Um, let's just dive into your thoughts on where you see the DeFi industry right now and, and how Trust Token is fitting into that. Yeah, so um, briefly on my background and involvement in the space and the CEO, Trust Token, we're about a 100 person team in the DeFi space. And we're the makers of both the true USD stable coin, which is a billion dollar fiat back stable coin, as well as the true Fi uncollateralized lending protocol. So it's an, it's an unsecured lending protocol directly on the blockchain, has originated $1.6 billion of loans in the last 18 months since it launched, and has really pioneered this sector of un and uh, under collateralized lending uh, on chain. So it's something we're very excited about. That's great to hear. And yeah, I would love to dive into the stablecoin discussion uh, in a little bit. And uh, first, I'd love to know, you know, about TrueFi just growing uh, the uncollateralized loans. Um, how have you seen the DeFi space growing and, and TrueFi growing with that? Yeah, so so we've we've been seeing this as one of the fastest growing sectors within DeFi, and it's become it's gotten a lot of recognition. So for folks that are not as familiar with DeFi. You know, DeFi decentralized finance is about taking the things that were used to be done by traditional financial institutions and starting to do them in smart contracts on blockchains. And most of this is happening on Ethereum, which is the largest smart, smart contract uh, supporting blockchain in the world today. But of course, it's starting to happen on some other important layer one chains like Solana and Avalanche as well. Um, but, you know, what we're seeing on Ethereum is billions and billions of dollars moving into DeFi. Uh, that's definitely taken a step back with this recent crypto crash and what's happened with UST and Luna. And that's something we can definitely touch on today, Ashton. But um, you know, even with some of the recent setbacks, it's still amazing to see billions of dollars being deployed in some of these decentralized finance protocols when it was just feels like just a few years ago, we were talking about thousands or millions so the the scale of this industry has grown massively and we think it is still less than one percent of where it's going to be when it has truly made an impact on global finance that's where we think DeFi is really headed mm, incredible and yeah um, i feel like you know it's possible to tokenize the entire capital markets uh, in one way or another and i feel like there's a lot of new financial products coming out that have um, you know, ad advanced financial products that are all over the TradFi space right now that are just sort of growing into DeFi and getting more institutional people involved in, in DeFi. And I feel like this crypto crash might be a, a good thing for institutional investors. Usually they're not the ones who bought at the top and, and crying on the way down. They see this as a buying opportunity. Would you say that so? Yeah, I think that's true. You know, the... So the crash that happened is very interesting. One of the major events is the fall of the uh, UST and uh, Luna system. So you know there's an, uh, this algorithmic stablecoin called UST, and you know was used in a bunch of different DeFi protocols, and it had a major major collapse. Um, there's you know there's a whole bunch of different stablecoin models, and stablecoins really provide a lot of the infrastructure upon which DeFi rests, because you can't do a lot of lending and trading and mm -hmm. other things you'd want to do on the blockchain in DeFi if you don't have stable coins, if you don't have you know, a US dollar equivalent or a euro equivalent to be able to work with. And so that was one of, one of the major pieces of this recent crash was um, the fall of this stable coin called UST, which was an algorithmically backed stable coin. So it was redeemable only for Luna, which is another very volatile cryptocurrency. And you can, of course, see why that could become a problem. Once people start redeeming it for the Luna, then, then they sell that Luna. The price of Luna goes down pretty soon. Uh, there's very, very little backing billions and billions of dollars of what people thought were stable coins. Um, so that is 
uh, a somewhat different model than the fiat backed stable coins, which is, you know, my company has produced several products of that kind. Fiat backed stable coins are backed by actual fiat currencies. And so, as you said, they are truly the tokenization of a real world asset. So, you hold one true USD, it's backed by one actual US dollar. And the same goes for USDC and many other fiat backed stable coins. They're backed by US dollars sitting in an actual bank account. And it's really just a way of taking those assets, those real world assets, whether it's fiat currencies or people are starting to work on commodities and securities and even real estate, and just be able to trade those on the blockchain and use them in decentralized finance protocols. So you know, we're connecting this layer of real world assets into the blockchain and getting a whole bunch of advantages from doing so. Mm -hmm. A great explanation there, Raphael. And speaking about uh, algorithmic stable coins versus fiat backed, and there are crypto backed stable coins as well. I've Absolutely. seen a lot of people in the crypto industry, you know, researching more into stable coins and you know what's actually backing it. Because um, I feel like a lot of uh, new investors and experienced investors as well uh, were in the UST stable coin and just didn't see when it all toppled to zero um, that you know how could this happen to my funds? Um, and you know, personally, totally. I, was, I, I was also wanted to give more education to people about different stable coins after this happened on you know where what's the best stable coin where do you put your money to ensure that the one dollar is going to equal one dollar uh, and I, I like uh, you know the name rings well true USD that it's like truly uh, backed by a dollar however I'm curious That's the idea I, I, I'm, I'm curious on you know the the details or the fine print behind that as well because you know they say with with USD tether and USDC being some of the major stable coins um, that there, it's not 100%, you know, U.S. dollars in in paper form that's in a bank account. There's also commercial papers, and they actually have treasury notes and other, you know, backing by uh, large corporations that aren't actually in U.S. dollars. And I'm curious, is that the case as well for True USD, or how does that work? Yeah. So all the funds from U from True USD are held with our actual banking partners. Um, now, you know, what you're describing is a complex question because you know, in modern accounting, you know, when people say cash and cash equivalents, you know, they'll include things like treasury bonds, uh, which of course, you know, are not truly completely risk-free, but are very close. And so I think that, you know, with stablecoin issuers like TrueUSD and USDC, you know, are, are generally being very careful with, you know, making sure that they're only putting that capital into you know, completely liquid assets that ultimately their banking partners feel very comfortable with backing. And that's part of the key thing here is, you know, this is not just like a technology company saying, hey, we're going to launch this product, but working with actual regulated banks mm -hmm. and those banks, you know, are holding that money in accounts and are being extremely conservative with that under the hood. It's kind of part of the nature of being a bank and making sure that you don't implode, implode as, a, as a very regulated institution. Mm -hmm. So um, I do think that there is some important uh, regulation that's going to be coming out pretty soon, probably on the back of this UST situation mm -hmm. and saying, okay, what really is a stable coin? You know, what do you have to be transparent about? So true USD has aimed to be one of the most transparent stable coins in the world and actually is the only stable coin that does real time 24 seven live attestations with a third party accounting firm. You can actually find those directly on our site. Um, so those, that's an accounting firm that is actually in real time inspecting the in, via API, the balances held with our banking partners and reporting those to the public. So you don't, you don't just have to trust us that those are backed by actual funds held by actual banks. Uh, you can, you can uh, see this report from a, an independent auditor. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's just an example of how we're trying to take trust to a really, really high level. Um, but I do think there's gonna be some important lines that need to be drawn about um, you know, what can call itself a stable coin? What does that term mean? What are people being transparent about? Can algorithmic stable coins or crypto backed stable coins um, use that same terminology? And how do they make sure that they are educating their users about what sorts of risks they are taking if they choose to hold a stable coin like UST? Mm -hmm. Definitely great points there, Raphael. And further to that, um, I've seen that even though you know there's contemplation on on for example USD Tether um, being one of the oldest stablecoins, whether it actually has 100% backing or not, it's still around today. 
but more totally. importantly, the, the reason that a, a lot of people are using it is because it is some of the default trading pairs on a lot of the exchanges and in DeFi. And you know, there are other stable coins like the one that Binance is working with, with, with Paxos, that is supposed to be um, you know, even more backed by actual US dollars than other commercial papers and, and whatever else they say. But it's not as used as much because it's not adopted into the DeFi ecosystem and into all these exchanges. So I'm, I'm curious on how exactly. USD is approaching that in bringing in um, you know, more availability for people to actually use it on all locations. Yeah, so it's a good question. True USD definitely does not have the penetration that USDT does. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, we work on that you know, through having strong partnerships and also just making True USD the most transparent and high quality product that we can. Um, but I do think it is a really interesting question for the entire crypto world that we have so much of our global trading volume relies on tether pairs. And Tether is almost certainly not the most transparent fiat backed stable coin on the market today. So uh, are we able as an industry to make a switch off of that? Does that present an existential threat or at least a catastrophic threat um, to our industry if there were to be an issue there? And we saw just recently Tether trading at something like, I think it was 95, 96 cents. So it's, not, it's never had a a you know serious crash or default the way that UST uh, did as it imploded recently, um, but Tether definitely has been shaky at times in a way that many other fiat stable coins such as True USD and USDC have not. Mm -hmm. Good point, Raphael. And I, I would love to jump back to you know the overall DeFi space and I guess taking an analogy from the UST Luna uh, you know debacle on yeah. how a lot of people are sort of even borrowing and, and using UST and then having to sell it. And then because of that, um, it's sort of a cascading effect. Um, in, in DeFi overall, you know, there's, there's people staking and they're liquid staking and they're able to, you know, that you've, I've seen the memes about people are able to borrow from here and then stake here, but then that gives you another token that allows you to stake over here. Uh -huh. And then that gives you another token that allows you to stake over here. And, you know, with the percentage of collateral, um, if there's any of those volatile assets that go down, then there can be like a margin call that sort of cascades through a bunch of different assets. Um, and I'm curious on your take on, on the DeFi space and, and how risky it is for, you know, when Bitcoin crashes and, and altcoins crash even more and people are using those in DeFi, um, if there's a cascading effect, it seems like altcoins are, are much more volatile than Bitcoin. They seem to crash a lot. Good question. So Ashton, there are definitely some very valid concerns about how reliant DeFi is on some of these volatile cryptocurrencies. And that's part of why at Trust Token, we've tried to build products like TrueUSD and like TrueFi, our lending protocol, that do not depend upon the success or failure or any of, the, of any of these volatile cryptocurrencies. So actually, if I could just show you a brief run through and, and how that works. Yeah, so, sure. um, so TrueFi is our protocol for uncollateralized lending on the blockchain. And uh, we've got a whole bunch of different lending portfolios, some of which just went live as recently as last week and present some great uh, lending opportunities for uh, any any folks that are interested in participating. So uh, if users are looking to deploy capital, um, please definitely consider uh, what we've got going here. Basically, the idea is, you know, we see DeFi not primarily as a way to you know, speculate on various volatile assets. We really see it as better financial infrastructure. So we can move, DeFi can al allows us to move money around the world in a simpler, faster, more efficient, and more transparent way. And so we are interested in applying that to lending. So there have been a bunch of, of protocols that have done what's essentially margin lending. These are the over collateralized lending protocols, things like Compound and Aave. You know, so on Compound, you can put up, let's say, 100 and $20 worth of Ether and then borrow $100 of USDC, uh, a stable coin. 
or, or you know, many other assets. And so it's over collateralized lending. Compound does not need to have any um, professional asset managers or underwriting on the platform because they're always holding you know, 120% or 150%, you know, very significant amount of collateral that they can liquidate if someone doesn't repay their loan. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a first generation of DeFi protocols, Compound, Aave, some of these other models. Um, what TrueFi and some other more recent protocols that have come out are doing is taking the next step and saying, okay, can we bring actual underwriting onto the blockchain and have lending pools that are pursuing interesting differentiated lending strategies and leveraging the advantages that DeFi presents? So just as an example here, um, so here's, here's a portfolio that we recently ran. Um, it's, now, it's now full um, it was very successful. And this is a portfolio that we ran with Alameda Research, where you can go through a KYC process on our website, um, deposit USDC into this portfolio, um, and then it will deploy capital directly with Alameda Research, which is one of the top names, one of the most legit trading forms in the in the crypto space. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's making these loans at eight percent APY. There's some TRU incentive tokens, that's the governance token of the protocol that are added on top of that for a total uh, ROI of 9.94 right now. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what you get as a lender. So what's interesting about this is this is an interesting lending opportunity. It's differentiated. It's not something that you're going to find on a Vanguard or on a, uh, whatever your uh, you know, wealth management platform is. And... Um, you know, we think it has very competitive returns, very attractive um, risk reward here. Uh, and um, it's facilitated through the blockchain, which allows us to really reduce the cost of managing this kind of investment. So if you think about, let's say, a, a BlackRock credit fund, right? You know, these folks raise and manage billions of dollars off chain. If you, think, you know, what is a small check in a BlackRock credit fund? Maybe it's you know maybe a million dollar check is a small check for them, right? They would ne they would probably never consider taking you know a ten thousand dollar check or a one thousand dollar check or anything like that. It just wouldn't be worth the overhead for them, right? And that's because running off, running off the blockchain, there's just all of these costs, these operational costs to be able to move money around and deploy capital, and. On the blockchain, we don't have that, or at least it's much, much smaller. And so we have lenders on our protocol that deploy nine-figure checks, you know, $100 million plus, and we have people that deploy $100 and everything in between. And that is part of the power and the flexibility of this kind of technology. And some of our, some of our portfolios that are liquid, you could actually deploy capital and decide that 15 seconds later in the next Ethereum block, you want to pull that capital out. That's how fast this kind of technology is. Or if you think about, okay, if you want to transfer US dollars via bank wire, you know, or send money to a financial institution, just how slow that is compared with how instantaneous things can be on the blockchain. So, mm -hmm. you know, here in DeFi, interest is, is paid out, you know, instantly 24 seven block by block, you know, depending on the protocol, you can oftentimes deposit and with draw immediately, anytime you want, move your money elsewhere. So it just creates a much, much more efficient, much more streamlined system. And this is really what we see as the future for finance in general. We think everything in finance is going to work this way, is going to have this level of transparency and efficiency, and that someday we're going to look back at the way finance was done before, and we're going to say, wow, that was crazy. The idea that something's going to take hours or days instead of seconds, it's going to be like, it's going to be wild. Incredible, Raphael, and thank you for explaining all of this. And, and you mentioned at the beginning about uh, uncollateralized lending, and we spoke a little bit about you know collateralization and having the 120, 150 uh, percent. I'm curious on you know uncollateralized lending and, and how that would work. Totally. So the way that TrueFi and a bunch of other of the newer lending protocols work is that they do actual underwriting on borrowers. So we've got, we've got portfolio managers 
that are generally professional asset managers. They will work with borrowers, review their balance sheet and their income and what risks they're taking and so on, and then determine what kind of credit they want to extend. And in some cases, they'll take some collateral. In some cases, they won't take collateral. But it's not like comp pound or Ave or Maker, where the protocol is saying, hey, you got to put up 120% collateral in Ether or Bitcoin or some other asset before we can extend you a loan. Because in this case, we're actually doing an underwriting process and really understanding that those borrowers are, are likely to repay that loan. This, of course, you know, if you're, if, you don't, if you're not holding that 120% or 130% collateral, there, of course, can be more risk, but you're oftentimes getting more reward as well. So if you look, for example, you know, at many of the lending pools on TrueFi, you can see here, um, let's say our, our USDC pool, one of our major pools, 6.33% APY unboosted. And with True, that's boosted up to 854 um, here's our BUSD pool, another stable coin um, that you mentioned with Binance and Paxos, 8.46% APY unboosted with the TRU token incentives, the governance token on top of that, 11.5%. These are some very attractive yields when you compare them to other opportunities, whether within DeFi or within TradFi. If we go over to Compound, for example, you can see here, you know, right now on TrueUSD, you can make 1.55, Tether 1.93, DAI 1.4, USDC 0.81. You're not even making 1% on USDC. And then you see, you know, with the boost of the comp token, which is the governance token for the compound protocol, that's going from 0.8 up to 1.28. So that's better. But still compare, you know, an all-in 1.28 with an all-in, you know, 8.5 or 11.5, right? Huge difference. So, um, so Compound protects itself um, and Ave protects itself by accepting this collateral. But of course, they can't, they can't command the same kind of pricing power that someone like a TrueFi can command. Because, you know, if you, look, if you think about leg, you know, legit trading firms, big borrowers, these folks, they aren't going to be willing to put up. If they want, if they want a $10 million loan, they're not going to be willing to put up $12 million of Ether. They either don't have it or they want to be put in that capital to work doing other things. For them, you know, they, they want working capital to be able to trade, to be able to provide liquidity. Uh, you know, they need to be working with their capital, not locking it up in a DeFi protocol. So I do think that that you know, margin lending and over collateralized lending, what, what many of these other DeFi protocols are doing is very important. And I think it's going to continue to be an important sector within DeFi. But the thing that's innovative about what my team and, you know, what TrueFi is doing is that it is able to actually do underwriting. We have professional portfolio managers that launch portfolios on the protocol and do actual underwriting. They can vet borrowers, make loans that accept and, and make loans that, that accept little or no collateral and ultimately provide uh, what we think are much more attractive risk adjusted returns uh, to lenders. And just to give you a sense of how that's turned out, if you take a look, you know, the protocols already had $1.19 billion repaid all in uncollateralized loans on the blockchains in stablecoin, you know, directly from the protocol to a borrower's Ethereum address, then back to the protocol. That's 1.19 billion repaid with zero defaults and an average interest rate that I think is somewhere around 9%. So that's pretty attractive. And so, you know, while we think this model has a long way to scale, orders of magnitude to scale before we'll really be impacting how lending works globally. Uh, at the same time, we feel like it is it's already proven itself as a model that, you know, this can work. Uh, we can do lending on the blockchain. We can do it in real size and it can provide very attractive returns. Mm -hmm. Incredible, Raphael. And thank you for showing those differences. And, you know, we don't have a lot of time left, but, you know, we talked about how uh, DeFi is really just like less than 1% of what you think and we think it will be. Um, and that this is poised to scale. Um, how do you position Trust Token moving forward to be the number one go-to DeFi platform um, as all of this capital comes in and hopefully, you know, 100% of the capital markets become, move into DeFi? Good question. Well, for us, a lot of it is about just continuing to execute well, 
you know, we're very focused on this un and under collateralized lending use case. We think it's a giant market and that, you know, a simple, well-built protocol that is being thoughtful about risk, being very thoughtful about smart contract security, being thoughtful about regulatory and legal risk, you know, that, that a protocol of that kind can absolutely win this. So that, that's where we're looking to position ourselves. Um, just to give you a sense, we actually just, um, our company Trust Token just signed a very big partnership with a, a major broker dealer in the space to be able to do compliant securities issuance in the United States. So that is part of how, you know, we have our core uncollateralized lending protocol that's a piece of open source technology that anyone can use. But then on top of that, we're looking to build the entire institutional platform, everything that more traditional financial technology and TradFi companies are going to want to be able to use this kind of DeFi protocol. Because a lot of these folks are not going to be just downloading MetaMask and you know, depositing some stable coins or borrowing some stable coins from a protocol, they're gonna want a lot more than that in terms of security, in terms of regulation, in terms of licensing, in terms of additional software for auditing and management. And so that's a lot of what we're working on in addition to developing the core protocol is what do we need to build on top of that to really bring in the next 10 billion, 100 billion, trillion dollars that we think is going to come into DeFi and ultimately spur the, the transition from DeFi being a niche area of asset management, a niche investment class, a niche tool for folks like you and me to have fun with, to really being something that changes how finance works around the world. Incredible, Raphael. And you're right, I think people are gonna want a lot more information um, and instead of just opening their MetaMask and, and jumping right in. And you know, with that said, how can the viewers learn more and follow along with all of the updates that your team is making at Trust Token and get involved? Good question. So please follow us on Twitter. I'm at Raphael Cosman, and um, our uh, company uh, is at Trust Token. And we also now have at TrueFi DAO for our protocols DAO. Um, if you go to TrueFi.io, just T-R-U-E-F-I dot I-O. We've got all the links there. We would love to have you join our Discord, have you join our forums. We've got a very engaged community that is setting up all different aspects of this protocol. And so if this is something that you're excited about, if you are interested in building the next generation of DeFi protocols and how the future of lending is going to work, please come and get involved with us. We would love to have you. Thank you so much, Raphael. And I will leave those links in the description box below as well to make it easy for the viewers. I really appreciate all of your ins insights into the DeFi industry and wishing you the best on TrueFi and Trust Token. And let's follow up in the near future. That'd be great. Thank you for having me on, Ashton. It was a pleasure.